both been there. The following interview was conducted with Royce Lambert, Purdue <coughs> Bachelor of Science 1964, Master's 1966, and Ph.D. in Agronomy and Soil Science, Purdue University in 1970. For the Purdue University Oral History Program, it took place on Wednesday, June 8, 2011, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good morning, Dr. Lambert. Good Thank morning. you very much. Let's start off. Tell us a little about where and when you were born and parents and early years. <coughs> I was born in Hendricks County, Indiana, uh, west of Indianapolis, approximately 30 miles. The uh, parentage there was my dad actually had bought the farm from his mother, uh, and that farm had been in the family for at least 40 years or more, and a really small farm, about 100 acres or thereabouts. Uh, so we had a, let's say, a farm which a lot of hills and valleys and things like that. We had horses early on. <clears throat> My dad had one of the first tractors in the area. The, uh, I probably was driving the team of horses who planted the last field of corn in that area by a horse-drawn vehicle. <clears throat> Shortly we converted that to a tractor pull planter and from there on it was the corn was put in the ground by a planter. My dad sometimes rented additional land from neighbors nearby, most typically very small farms. Uh, nothing in the so-called lake country, which had a lot of flat farm, but uh, we survived and had a, a good set of parents. I have a brother who is a couple of three years younger than me, a sister that's five years younger than me, and they, he became a minister. Uh, my sister became a teacher, um, and they are now in Colorado and uh, near Atlanta, Georgia, respectively. Okay. <coughs> the, uh, Tell us about uh, grade school. What was school like? My grade school was Amo High School, grade school and high school. Okay. Uh, I was born in the 1930s, and so there was not that many kids born in that area at that time because of the, the hardships and things they had to go through. I attended the Amo, high, Amo school system for all 12 years. Myself and one other fellow were the only students who went the full 12 years at Amo High School. The upshot was by the time I graduated, there was 10 in my class, a few dropped out and a few were pregnant and other things. <clears throat> so we ended up with 10 in the class and I was actually selected as the president of the senior class. Uh, I actually came back this trip for my 60th high school alumni uh, meeting and uh, there was uh, four, of the girl, four of the five girls left and one other fellow and myself, the, of the five fellows left. So I always jokingly said it was difficult to stay in the top 10% of my class because there was only 10 of us. And I never studied in grade school or high school very much. <laughs> so anyways. Uh, what were some of the activity? What was school like? Was it very It must not have been very long. Uh, we didn't even have kindergarten. I started first grade at five years of old, age. And my birthday came in November, so I was in school uh, at a fairly early age yeah. and uh, my first teacher was a Mrs. Brown and she was my second grade teacher, etc. I had another uh, uh, single lady who was my third and fourth grade teacher. By the time I got to high school she got more training and she became my math teacher. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Amo was such a small school at that time. Uh, the training program was not very good. It was okay, but it just wasn't deep enough to really get me sure. into Purdue and do Did well. Did they have any clubs or what about athletics? Anything? No like clubs. That? We had athletics. Okay. But it was a small enough school. We did not have a football team. We had a softball team, a track team, and basketball. And girls had to. Well, we all had to participate in sure. PE that type of thing. But right. there was no girls basketball or anything right. like right. that. So. I participated a little bit in the track team <clears throat> and the basketball team and thought I was pretty good, but I found later that I was not that good, and it was all in my head for the most part, <clears throat> so I understood why the coach didn't play me a whole lot <laughs> later in life. <clears throat> uh, however, it was for experience and enjoyment. And experience, right? yes, right. right. So uh, we have basically had no clubs in the school that I can recall other than something like 4-H or we didn't have FFA at that time. Mm -hmm. So we had 4-H and I participated in some of those type of things. Sure. Uh, showed hogs primarily, uh, cattle once or twice at the county fair and <clears throat> uh, Wells' 
Parker, my neighbor down the stream, uh, became a veterinarian, and he uh, and my brother and I went to Indianapolis to State Fair and literally stayed with the hogs or cattle, whatever we had in the, in the farm buildings or the fairground buildings, uh, and uh, slept on the hay or straw and, and took, took, care, took of care of the animals. Right. <clears throat> and yeah. we would show them later in the day. <clears throat> so uh, we actually had to help with the farming activities, and uh, it was just expected, I guess. Our father never yelled at us. He just said, we're going to do this today, and right. we went out and did it. Right. Um, so we... It was a busy years during high school. We grew mostly corn and wheat and oats, hay. Uh, those were harvested and primarily fed the cattle on the farm. The corn was fed the hogs directly. Uh, never, they were afraid to never sold corn to the market, <coughs> per se. <coughs> And all the hay was utilized on the farm. And of course, when you utilize all the hay, there's a lot of manure. So we got to clean out the sheds and things like that with a pitchfork and did have a spreader, but yeah. just that type of thing. Let me like ask you this. What was, you said your father had one of the first tractors. What was it like? It was, it was an Almost Chalmers tractor. Okay. Uh, he was actually, the first one in the county? The I'm not sure of that. Okay. Uh, but, uh, his one of the early ones. Early ones. His brother, Arthur Lambert, uh, bought a either owned or helped run an Alice Chalmer dealership out of Clayton, Indiana. Uh, Dad somehow got enough money together to buy this first tractor he had, and I believe it was actually a steel wheel tractor. And he was out in the garage shop combination one morning with a lantern, getting a tractor filled up. The gasoline got on fire that burned the tractor down to the ground. Literally. <clears throat> the paint was it was so hot a fire it actually burned the paint on the back of the house. It never caught fire, but it was blistered even when I was a teenager. It was still blistered paint on the house. Wow. So he, was he injured at all? No, he had, had time to get away. jump in his car and run the old car out of the shop, but the tractor burned down the heap. Well, oh somehow he got enough money together and he bought another tractor, which was one of the early rubber tired tractors in Henry's County, at least in our area. <clears throat> And it was an Alice Chalmers. When I was uh, born in 1933, uh, I learned to drive that tractor at probably less than 10 years old. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> it, was, it was difficult to steer. There was, uh, we jokingly called it Armstrong Steering because that was your own arms that did the steering. And no, no power steering at all whatsoever. <coughs> uh, so we had that tractor for through World War II, actually. And uh, after World War II, he bought a newer Alice Chalmers, and, and a little later, I bought an Alice Chalmers when I was married uh, about age 19 or 20, and uh, that became my pride and joy, the brand new tractor. Right. <coughs> what was it dur uh, like during the, in the war in your community? Uh, you or? Everybody was... Did well, your father continue to farm? Yes, he farm? was never drafted. He okay. had to continue the farm, or did, and... Uh, uh, Several people were drafted to go to World War II, and some went to Pacific, some went to Europe, and maybe even Africa. I, I just don't sure, know. Right. I was still young enough, and I right, yeah. But I flat out recall this condition when Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, we were in the middle of the country, of course, and we were sort of paranoid and didn't know. And we had a battery, or literally had a battery radio, which had to charge up every night. Uh, but uh, one night I woke up in the room we were sleeping in and I saw lights off to the west about a half a mile. I literally almost panicked. I thought the Japanese were coming. And, well, it was automobile, which I actually were going someplace after dark. <clears throat> but as a young kid, seven years old, I thought the Japanese had already gotten to Indiana <clears throat> and uh, from Pacific. Interesting, uh, interesting. Well, and so after, tell us what, uh, after high school then, what came next? You came to uh, college? I, I, first of all, I was going to go to an engineering type school. It was Letourneau Tech in Texas. Where had to, you heard about that? Or uh, My uncle and cousins had this little brochure that they got. Sure. Uh, it showed these huge earth movers, and apparently you could work in their shops and learn to assemble and make drawings and whatever else to make these big earth movers. I always thought that would be exciting. Well, I, Purdue was totally almost out of my mind. I was going to go to Texas. Well, I'd never been away from the farm more than a week, you know. 
So I said, well, maybe I should go close in. If I'm going to go to engineering, I'll go to Purdue. And I learned later that my training at AMO High School was not really well done enough to really compete engineering-wise. So I eventually ended up at Purdue and started in the School of Engineering. And I, Did you come down for a visit before you came? Or? Yes, I did. Okay. okay. Uh, but my goal was that thinking I would, might be aeronautical engineering. <clears throat> well, had I been able to complete that stage of my life and go to school, I probably were in the same classes that the early astronauts, Grissom, et cetera, sure, graduated. Okay. And Armstrong. Yes. However, uh, after the first uh, semester, uh, I said, uh, I'm having difficulty and transferred to the School of Agriculture. <clears throat> I didn't know sure what I was doing, so I literally enrolled in the general agriculture program, thinking that I would probably go back to the farm and take over the thing from my dad. In the meantime, I met a lady here at the Baptist Christian Student Foundation, and I guess we had enough in common. We yeah. hit it off. and. Uh, probably made a mistake, but I gave her a box of chocolates the first Christmas we had, and she and her family went to Arizona. She did not share the chocolates with anybody else, and, uh, well, it was not too cool to live together at that time, and so we elected to get married. I dropped out of Purdue. We married, and that marriage lasted 55 years Wonderful. prior to her death. Was she, uh, a, she was a student at the She time? was in Homec or... Right, okay something like that anyways here. And she lived in a co-op that was called N. Tweedale, uh, which was, the house was over at the around. northwest corner of the stadium. The house is no longer there. It's been torn down oh, many, many okay. years. I recognize the name of the co-op. Uh, there's yeah. another one, and it's replaced itself, and I don't know if the name's the Street Waldron right. or someplace up in there now. Sure, okay. Well, where did you, <coughs> then you, did you come back to campus and finish? I, uh, I, uh, After you got married? No. Oh. I farmed for three or four years, <clears throat> and it was a sad day in my life when I told my father that I think I want to do something else, because he more or less expected me to take over the farms. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I then took my wife and two young boys by that time, and we literally drove, moved to Arizona. I worked as a um, mechanic trade type thing, not in engines, but in in the window door business and uh, well after a year or so of that I said well maybe I should go back to Purdue again so I'd load them back up and we came back to Purdue and I enroll, enrolled in the D Department of Vocational Agriculture the thinking to become a vocational agricultural teacher and uh, I was uh, eventually elected uh, corresponding secretary of that organ student organization in vocational agriculture at that time, uh, the Indiana uh, teaching situation, you had to start a master's within five years, complete it within 10. So, okay, we're here, and we lived over in Lawn Avenue here with a family and boys, and, and by that time, another girl. And uh, we uh, lived over there then for the next eight or 10 years because, mm -hmm. well, if I'm going to do a master's degree, we just well stay here rather than move and do something else. And, and so my wife uh, had a job in electrical engineering, and uh, later she transferred over to biological sciences, <clears throat> sportive all the way, but it, uh, to add money to our cash account, which was pretty limited, I worked jobs on the side, I sure. washed windows, I mowed lawns, uh, several right. types of things to add cash. Where were you, where, where most of your classes, were they in what's now known as Fender Hall, in Etymology Hall, or? I had an early what, class Lily, in animals. Was Lily built when you were here? <coughs> Lily? Lily Hall? Yes. Oh, okay. I believe so. All right. I think it came in the 60L. I think so. Well, when it, we started, it was yeah. 51, 52. <coughs> I cannot remember. Yeah. Okay. But I think it was up then. Anyways, uh, I did have classes, and I just told my friend this morning, I remember judging animals in this old heard that used to be a facility for facility on campus. Facility for yeah. judging campus. Sure. <clears throat> right, exactly. Anyways, uh, I was not a very good animal judge and looks at the things, and so that was when we decided to leave and get married and <laughs> go away. <clears throat> After being out 
eight or nine years, and we're in Arizona, so let's go back to Purdue, <clears throat> see if we can get this degree in vocational agriculture and principally teach in high school. Sure. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, on the way back, we basically had an old box trailer with our total possessions and three kids, and uh, anyways, uh, started restarted again. Uh, my friend, Dr. Wills Parker, was very influential in helping me get started because the most difficult thing I'd read in those 10 years was the cartoons in the newspaper. And it was a struggle the first year or two to get going again, <clears throat> to learn who people were, to borrow class notes, and those kinds of things. Get back in the regime. To get back in the study regime. <clears throat> uh, we uh, survived the, the, the bachelor's degree, and I was so busy trying to survive that I didn't have really time to do too many other things. <clears throat> Our kids were, two, two earlier kids were in grade school by that time. Mm -hmm. So we had to attend their activities and kept going. So anyways, they, <coughs> they, uh, <coughs> uh, After you mastered it, then you must have gone on. Did you go on for your PhD after that? Well, here's the part of that story. Oh. <coughs> I expected to finish up and go into teaching. But in the master's degree program, I was allowed, if you will, or invited to participate in the college agronomy classes, or soils classes in particular, to become a uh, lab instructor. <clears throat> and I really enjoyed that age group of people. So we, uh, I have a, another experience with that. <clears throat> I was teaching a class, and I was standing with my back to the students who were sitting on the first row of bench, uh, of lab benches. <clears throat> One of those students apparently had a seizure and was falling over, <clears throat> and the students kind of got my attention. I had no training in dealing with that kind of a thing. <clears throat> I sent the student out in the hallway to recover. Well, he did, but I thought many years later, how could I be so dumb that I didn't even get help and leave the other like 15 that. students sitting there? Yeah. But it was a good experience. Okay, there's some things. Fortunately, it worked out okay. <coughs> worked out okay. <coughs> Anyways, uh, he recovered and got back into class, but just never expected that kind of thing. <coughs> Hands-on learning. There you go. <coughs> okay. So uh, while I was in the, actually my first year or two here, I played on the Cary, well, I lived in Cary Hall East, and played on the volleyball team. <clears throat> we won every game that year until we went to the final tournament. We got beaten severely in the very first game. Everything we did was an error. <clears throat> well, went back to being a student again. <laughs> so... Got disenchanted because we lost, right? That's yes. <clears throat> okay. So anyways, my <clears throat> my early professors here were, uh, I think his name was Ed, but we called him E.E., -E, Dr. Clannon, and he was Ag Education, and Dr. Klaus, I've totally forgotten his first name. Uh, Jim, I believe it was. <clears throat> so anyways, I went through the vocational agriculture program, and uh, again, as I said earlier, I had to get the master's started, so we started that. I elected not to continue in, in uh, ag education, but shifted over to agronomy. <clears throat> I knew I didn't want to go in animal science because I took too much continuous work, cleaning, scooping, and right. looking after. So I thought, well, I'll go into crops or soils. And so that's kind of where we ended up over there. <clears throat> but in order to earn money, I worked in the uh, small animal unit in the animal science department. Most of the next two or three years after we started the master's program, washing down hog pens and cleaning up after things and keeping the rats and mice fed and all that kind of good stuff in the animal science department. <clears throat> I had a good friend who I literally met during that time frame, and he was in southern Indiana, forgotten where. Uh, he was in animal science and eventually got his PhD there. <clears throat> he was a student at the same time he was you were? Uh -huh. Not an undergraduate, but a graduate student. Okay. <clears throat> Tom McDonald. <clears throat> He went to work for a, uh, let me call it a feed company in Iowa, and literally died of a massive heart attack really early in his career. <clears throat> so we don't know about that, but it happens. <clears throat> so anyways, uh, when I came uh, after that time frame, uh, 
and in the agronomy department, I met Dr. Jim Ulrichs, uh, Dr. Bill McPhee just came on the faculty at that time. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rudy uh, Hiltz was on the crop science end of the thing. He was a great teacher. Uh, my professor was Dan Wiersma, uh, who was Cunny in Soil and Water Conservation, which is really where I wanted to come in. Up. So I was assigned where he took me on as a grad student <coughs> and was very helpful, very good Christian man, and uh, he had been trained at Berkeley and uh, left me to really scratch, if you will, to, because he was not good at helping me. So I had to think through what I was doing and work through systems like that. And I didn't want to blame him, but this is his approach to for being a professor. Anyways, uh, I learned, well, if I ever got to that kind of position, I would be more willing to help the student think through things and get things planned out. But it's a learning process. <clears throat> after we got the master's degree done, or after, what the oral exam actually, and uh, Jim Ulrichs and probably McPhee, and I've forgotten who else was on the committee, went to the committee and did my oral exam. Filed out expected to say, Congratulations, you passed. Guess what? They said, congratulations, we recommend you go on. I never in the faintest back of my mind ever think, thought about going for a PhD. <clears throat> well, there was through those encouragements and willingness of a spouse to keep working and kids to deal with the school situation. And you've lived here for a while, too. Another, you know, you another four yeah, years. Sure, you were comfortable so, in the community, you knew people. So my uh, research finally evolved in doing some field work for Dr. Wiersma down in... South Indiana, can you remember the town anymore? Actually, it wasn't a town, we were out in the country. Uh, he allowed me to, or helped me hire a high school student who went with me. We did the field research down there a summer or two and then other places in, in sure. up here. So uh, that became my project in general was to try to figure out how to quickly measure water infiltration into soils. <coughs> the uh, research. I was two years as a, a graduate st a teaching assistant, so I really liked that group. But by the time I got to be uh, ready for the PhD program, I went off of that training program because it took so much time, and I needed to spend the time studying and preparing and doing research, etc. So thankful to Dr. Wiersma's uh, gratuity, if you will, he put me on a three-quarter time assistantship which helped us financially greatly in the process. Uh, he uh, was very kind to me, even though he was a little bit diff uh, reticent to give me direct directions. However, we survived and uh, eventually was able to pass the oral exams. And uh, here's another subset of the story. Dr. Byron Blair was on my committee. Dr. Wiersman was the chief, and Blair was on it. Uh, uh, I'm losing track of the names here, just a minute. Uh, I literally looked in my thesis okay, that's fine. a few days ago to find the name. Okay. Uh, it happened to be Bill McPhee. And I just. Who was the head for a long time? Oh, yeah, but before, way before that, he just came on the faculty. He was a young guy. <coughs> well, here's where I want to go with that story was that. Uh, I was in Dr. M uh, Dr. Blair's class. It was an ecology type class. And he had done some research at that time. Computers were huge machines occupying a whole room and they had a card file that you fed to the computer. And one of his questions came on the written exam of, from him that how would you explain to somebody uh, you were dealing with about this particular research? I flat out did not understand what he was doing, and I gritted my teeth and literally wrote back to that question, if you didn't understand it any better than I did, you couldn't communicate it to somebody else. Uh, oh, I thought it was literally going to hit the fan when he came for the oral exam and I was about shaking my boots. I think God was in control because 
Dr. Blair had a heart attack and could not come to my oral exam. So uh, Dr. Burns substituted for him in the oral exam, and I had a class in forest soils under Dr. Burns over in the forestry area. Very nice fellow. He treated me well. And uh, to this day, I never understood how he could teach that class because it was myself as a grad student and one other undergraduate. And he would come talk to us daily Just for two people. Uh, he must have been bootlegging his teaching career someplace because to date that would not happen <laughs> so anyway, whatever uh, his uh, so one on one his one on one almost and he had a small lab which we did some things and it's kind of related to soil physics and those kind of things but anyways he came to the oral exam his very first question was well you're going for a doctor of philosophy could you explain what philosophy is it hit me cold. I was thinking about research projects and things like that. and I think I stood there for five minutes trying to figure out, well, how do I answer this question? <laughs> we kind of must have got a correct or sort of close answer because he never challenged it. And uh, after struggling with that uh, for an hour or two or whatever we had for the old exam, congratulations, you're now a PhD. And I was, had lived in Arizona a little bit and I had looked in Arizona for a potential job site. Didn't happen, and I had an opportunity then to uh, interview the Dean of Agriculture from Cal Poly State University, State College at that time, and he met me in Chicago, and the very next day I met with a similar person from the uh, Cal Poly Pomona, was interviewed, and the people at San Luis Obispo uh, offered me a job. Uh, I heard later that I was one of about 75 applicants for that job. Uh, they picked me out of the lineup probably because of my agricultural background. Uh, I have the hands-on learning of being a farm kid, and uh, uh, so I joined that faculty. At that time, I think I was a sixth person. Uh, then five years, a couple of the guys had retired, including the department head. So I was hired, uh, and that department grew dramatically in the next five to ten years. We had up, I think, ten or eleven faculty, plus some teaching assistants, and I went there principally because of the climate as well as the school, its uh, training program, hands-on type training, uh, and at that time, basically no research was required. You, it was all teaching? Well, that's all straight almost straight teaching. Okay. We picked up a new president at the university about that same time, and then he started encouraging people to do research to help supplement your learning. Uh, I, I did a little bit, but not much. And uh, of course, I re taught 25 years. Uh, my research approach was to spend the summers, early summers, working for the National Park Service and the National Forest Service. So I would go to these various places with various assignments and uh, come back and share photographs and what I'd learned out in those assignments instead of, quote, doing research. So I had a fairly extensive uh, uh, series of photographs which would get to be applied to lectures and things. Sure. And, and the things I learned I could share with students uh, in the next 10 or more years. Right. How was the student body? Did that increase? Well, when you came there, was it smaller? And do they have undergraduate and graduate program at there? At that stage, no graduates at all. Okay. When, you're, you're, when you first went there? No. Okay. All undergraduates. And and in the next few years, that school or college which was converted to a university system. Okay. Not University of California, but as a subunit. subunit and there was 19, I think there's now maybe 20, which are now... California State Universities, right. and they're different than the California University of California. Right. Most of the agricultural research was done at uh, either Berkeley or uh, University of California Davis. <coughs> uh, Cal Poly was outstanding in their still learn by doing approach, hands on education. Uh, by the time I was I'd been there maybe 20 years. The department had grown to 150 students in soil science. 
uh, and then it slowly evolved over into environmental science for uh, land degradation things. Sure. Uh, roughly half the students by that time were in that area, and the other half were into agricultural production sure. type things. And uh, the school at that time was, I believe, the fifth largest undergraduate school in the States. But here, you hear Purdue, you hear Illinois, uh, it's got Michigan State, et cetera, sure. but hardly ever hear about Cal Poly. But they have done very well, the students do well. About 10% of the students that came from Cal Poly would go on to graduate school, including some here at Purdue. Uh, at least uh, one of my students uh, came here for a master's degree, continued to his PhD. He went to the University of Arkansas for several years, and he was invited to come back here and be the department head of agronomy, Craig B. Rudy. And Craig was here a few years, and then in the past two years, he was invited to become the Dean of Agriculture at uh, Colorado State. Mm -hmm. I have a former student who also became the uh, Crop Science Department Chair at Cal Poly, and she was there for a few years, and then she went to Chico State and became the Department Head of the School of Agriculture. Well, not Department, but Head of the School, sure. you know, the Dean, Dean type thing. Yeah. So our students yeah. had the ability, uh, they were well trained, and in many cases, the upper division classes in uh, Cal Poly Soil Science Department were equivalent to what most students would be taking for the master's degree program. So they could walk into Purdue or other schools and did very well. Right. They were all sort of pre-trained, if you will, maybe not to ex so deep a subject matter, but they, were, they yeah. did well. What about, did you have people in the, the community college system that were also transferred? Some, to, yes, some but okay. not many. Because you have a lot that, California's always had a big community college. Yeah, program. but we didn't have many that came into soil science. Okay. Most of them were you know, what are in the other types of sciences sure. or arts. Arts, right. <coughs> Is it a resident facility as well to the students? Res Do you have residents? Yes, okay. uh, there were residents on okay. campus. And they had but a lot of them lived, lived in, most of them lived in the, community. in the homes and rentals and that type of thing. Sure, okay. Those have the common problems of Students making too much noise and whatever. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, but in the past 10 years, since I, well, I've been retired now 16 years. Uh, when did you retire? 1994. Uh, two or three things happened. Uh, my father died in that actually same year, and he was in Florida, so I had to kind of go help with family members there. My mother was not in good health. Uh, I had a student who kind of got to me, uh, one of those individuals that, do I have to learn this? I said, no, you don't have to learn anything. Why are you here? And then he kept bugging me and I just got tired of it. I said, maybe I'm one of those old guys that I don't want to be like. Maybe it's time to do say goodbye else, right? and do something else. Sure, okay. So I retired mm -hmm. and uh, I went back the first year and did a lot of uh, cleanup of things, uh, uh, cleaning up the bottles that were stashed all over the place and and replaced the glass in the greenhouse and those kind of things, free of charge, just something to do. Sure. Help them get something. We did not have a technician at that time. Right. After I left, they got a technician that took care of all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so. right. Okay. What about, uh, we talk about family. You mentioned you have a couple of children. Did they go to school out there as well? Uh, my older son, uh, who's now 57, actually came back to Purdue the first year, and he was either homesick or whatever, and he came back to California and eventually had a, uh, got a degree in uh, state and regional planning in, from Cal Poly in the architecture <coughs> department. Uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, in the past five years, uh, he has developed uh, dementia and is probably gonna have to deal with Alzheimer's at a relatively young age. Uh, is he still able to work at all? No, he's been uh, oh, okay. uh, on an early retirement type program for two for to three some, years. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. So anyways, uh, he and his wife uh, had two adopted boys, and uh, they are now roughly 20 years old. Sure. And, uh, 
then my second son uh, went to junior college out there in California. Then he went to Colorado, at Gunnison, Colorado, kind of Western, I believe it was. And he was able to get a degree. Well, I should back up, he did get a degree, but he was a, a magna cum laude in history. So he learned a lot about history and was a good student. And he went there actually on an athletic scholarship and he was on the basketball team. Uh, he went to Penn State and his dad was very really aggravated when he said he was not going to finish his PhD. He was within about six months of finishing. He said, I've seen what it does to professors who have to publish. He said, I don't want to do that. So he eventually became a coach and coached Penn State women's team, assistant coach. He did that at Oregon State and he eventually ended up in Germany coaching pro teams there and he did that about six years. In basketball? In basketball. Okay, all right. Uh, he literally was basically fired because the manager wanted to coach more than let the coach do it. So he uh, was riding a train one day and he said, I have an idea. There's no good central source of information for basketball coaches. So he developed over the next 10 years a website which is called Basketball Highway and he promoted that and was doing very well with it, he earned a little money off of it. No, not wealthy, but he got it going. Sure. He had the website name. He decided to expand. They needed a little more in money. And unfortunately, one of those people he brought on board or agreed to work with basically took him what we'd call to the cleaners. He just wiped out his resources and everything else. He was able to re retain the domain name, still Basketball Highway, and he is to this day still trying to get that up and going mm -hmm. again after 10 years early work to get it going. So that's what happens when you have Those things happen. bad yeah. relationships, I guess. I have a daughter who's now about 50 years old. Uh, she married really early, had a couple of kids, uh, went to uh, Chico State College one year, and it was known as the party school, and I don't, never did see her grade report, but I know it wasn't good. And she then elected to go into uh, financial situation, uh, credit union type things, and worked as the, in that field for many years. And so her kids are now roughly 20 years old, and um, she's been in Pennsylvania most of her last 10 years, and just recently told me she was moving back to California where she went to school. And uh, so... She'll well, be a little closer. A little closer <laughs> there, right. Yeah. Any uh, awards and honors, that, any awards that you get you'd like to share with us? Uh, yes, okay. I, uh, when I, I was in California and uh, was in highly involved with the Salt and Water Conservation Society. Uh, my department head did not seem to encourage this very well, but I could see the handwriting on the wall if I wanted to be recognized. I had to go out of the school itself and became highly involved with the Salt and Water Conservation Society. I was on there uh, board, I guess it was called, for several years, and eventually was appointed uh, incoming president and became president of that organization. Uh, I was uh, awarded several different awards during that time frame, and still teaching, still working with students, and I was the uh, leader, if you will, to organize two different annual meetings in which we brought in top-notch speakers, and the students did a lot of the work. Sure. Or but able to be there too. having some exposure and uh, and so that eventually evolved into being awarded the Saltwater Conservation Society's highest award, which is called the Fellow Award. Um, since that time, they now have another one, which is named after the founder of Saltwater Conservation Salt Conservation Service. But uh, anyways, that time was one tenth of one percent of the membership was eligible for this award. Very nice. You had to be nominated by at least 40 people. So I guess the Californians recognized what I had tried to do, sure. and I received that award roughly 1980. And that was very humbling to realize that somebody thought enough of me and my skills to do this. To be recognized, right. And yeah, not, right. basically no research, uh, because 
many of those quote fellow awards, you're doing research plus teaching plus everything Varies else. Varies with society. Varies and, with the candidate too, I think. Right. You know, right. So, anyways, uh, that was exciting but very humbling in the process. Right. Um, Professional uh, associations, you still keep active in any of them, or? After 40 years, I elected to drop out, yeah. mainly because I needed resources to help a son who's struggling yeah. financially, and it was $80 a year, and I had just kind of lost interest in the sure. whole thing. I knew a lot of people, but I yeah. needed, the, right. needed the $80 to help pay the son's rent. Right. So I just dropped out. Okay. And uh, uh, in the process, obviously, I lost back contact with people that okay. so never went to meetings. However, th this will lead you to another part of the story, Good. if you've got time. Oh, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll the, uh, mm -mm. I was asked to go back, after receiving this national honor, to participate in a national meeting in Iowa. And I did, and had a committee type thing, which, which I've now forgotten what we were dealing with. But anyways, one evening we went out to a local farm to uh, a barbecue type thing, and out in the back were uh, some restored agricultural equipment, tractors and threshing machines and various things. I think I would like to do that. Even though I had no experience in it, I just grew up on a farm which everybody did. We didn't have much, you made it work. <laughs> okay, I can do this. And that led to me purchasing a 1952 John Deere tractor. And it took me about a year, but I got it restored up and running and looked like a brand new one. The paint job was probably better than a brand new one. And uh, that evolved to buying another John Deere tractor. And I actually. Where did you keep them in California? Yes, I, I, uh, I had moved by that time and uh, had to build a shop. And I actually had six different tractors. I had three John Deere's, two Alice Chalmers, uh, 1935 um, uh, Farmall. And by chance, I was a lucky raffle winner of a small engine built by. Uh, International Harvester McCormick Deering. So that led to another part of the story. I then started dealing with small farm engines. Uh, most of them uh, hit and miss or water cool type things sure. with one cylinder. And, and I was involved with that club and eventually became president of that club for five years. And <laughs> so organization and writing. Never know where it's going to take you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I showed tractors in parades and went to shows and, uh, and eventually showed engines and other things. And so uh, it was an exciting time and strangely enough, I had to sell off all my big tractors when I moved to Arizona. I uh, had no place to store them, but I did bring one lawn and garden tractor and since that time I restored two more and uh, sold one of those, but I still have the other one. So. Sure. So those tractors are fairly unique. They were made by John Deere for lawn and garden groups. Uh, mechanically, they're just like the green and yellow ones, but they made them three years. They're now called the patio tractors. The hoods and the seat are the same colors. They had red, yellow, orange, and blue. <laughs> I'm simply putting this on the tape so you can think about it. I heard last year that somebody located one of the red seats, never been used, brand new stock, and that seat sold on eBay for $2,500 for the seat alone. So it's not an inexpensive hobby. No, it's not. But here, I didn't buy it, but my rationalization is I, I tried golf, I didn't like it, and I had high scores and said, okay, here is 60 to $80 a week or month for playing golf with this little piece of paper uh, that says I have a high score and I was frustrated. Okay, so that's kind of got me enhanced of starting the tractor and, and engine restoration type projects, and I justify that as a way of spending the money. Right, and you got hands on And too. I have fun doing it, right. and meeting not interesting people. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, how about an outstanding event? You can have, if you uh, have anything comes to mind. Well, I guess the most sad event, my wife of 65 years died three years ago. And we were partners, and we enjoyed a good life together. Right. It's sad, but uh, it happens. And uh, uh, other than that, sadness, sure. of course, I enjoy my family. My kids are in good relationships with each other. 
and the award which I received from Solon Water Conservation Very was nice. a okay. highlight. Yes. And retirement activities, now you talked about your tractors. I'm still restoring engines and tr no more big tractors, but engines and tractors and where things. Do you, where are you able to find some? Do you see them on what? On the internet or well you can okay. sometimes eBay type things sure. sometimes magazines have advertisements uh, uh, yeah strangely enough sometimes they come to me I plus I go to show and I have a tractor yep. engine and somebody comes up and taps me on the shoulder would you be interested in restoring such and such and so I've gotten two or three like that uh, yeah word of mouth and think just contacts like that's right and uh, they see they like my work, and I restore them to what appears to be at least near new. Um, do you have a little place on your uh, at your house where you can do the repair? Or? I have a two-car garage and a space for a golf cart, which now the space for my tractors and sure. engines and things. And in my community, about eighty well, about fifty percent of the people actually go back to the Wisconsin or Michigan or someplace, uh, uh, Washington State during the summer. So it's pretty quiet, and so I can make a lot of noise, and nobody cares. There's nobody there, and so <laughs> I that, do my works, work. that works okay. <laughs> and uh, so it's a uh, a fun That's type really thing. Nice. And, and I'm involved a little bit with the church that I joined there, sure. And uh, volunteer uh, typically on Mondays to go do the uh, repairs, changing light bulbs out, putting stools in restrooms, and things like that. Uh, for an hour or two and it, it, a meeting with interesting people and I was going to sing in the choir which I have done for many years but uh, due to some problems here I decided to, get decided to kind of bypass that. Okay. So, so I'm yeah. still involved with the group but most of the people I know anymore are seniors and, and many of them are deceased and so that's part Just of life. Just take each day. Anything that I forgot to ask or anything in closing you'd like to say? Uh, well, uh, other than back in the uh, professional associations, okay. I was a California charter member of the American Society of Agronomy established in California. Wonderful. Uh, and consequently, I never attended their meetings, but was so involved with the Soil and Water Conservation Group that I yeah. basically had to make some choices. And so I kind of let that one slide, but was an early member. Of California chapter. Yeah, I, I gather it still goes. It's still going. Oh, yes. oh yeah, right. Okay. And there's a national organization out of Wisconsin that uh, almost lost contract with them. So. Sure. Uh, anyways, that's pretty much it, I guess. So just, oh, I have another story I wanted to tell. Okay. There's a gentleman who ran the farm when I was here. His name is Ozzie Luchtemeyer. Uh, Mr. Luchtemeyer was a very good person to help with the farm and working with the different professors. He uh, uh, was a great friend of the grad students who sometimes used the farm for research projects. Mm -hmm. One year Dr. Peterson apparently rented a bus for the agronomy department for faculty and students, grad students, and we went out to Kansas City, I believe it was, to agronomy meeting. On that bus was Mr. Luchtemeyer, we called him Ozzy for short. He apparently recognized that I didn't have very much money. And on the way back, we stopped at a restaurant just as they were ready to close. We went in and the people agreed to open up their grill again, or the dinners. And here is a rough, roughly 40 people, half grads had faculty, all of us had dinner at that restaurant, after hours almost, if you will. Two things happened that really impressed me. Number one, Ozzy Luchtemeyer offered to buy my dinner. I hardly had any cash at all, and I was going to have to really tighten the belt. That, number one, has always stuck with me, is a willingness to help somebody else. He sensed that he liked to do it. He did that, yes. Uh, the other side of the coin was that when we got ready to leave, we were there an hour, I suppose, or more, he took off his hat, passed the hat to collect tip money, if you will, for the people who had stayed overtime at that restaurant. And that certainly impressed me also. Right. But I've never forgotten Ozzy's willingness to help. 
And it's not against the professors. There was another 15 on the bus. Not one of them recognized that I had almost no money and never offered to buy anything. And so but I... somebody did. And somebody nice. did. Right. And that was Ozzy Luptemeyer. And right. Ozzy recently just died. Yeah, I know he did. I sent his... Sent a note which I found his name address. He was living out here at the retirement community. Mm -hmm. He was in the advertisement. I sent him a note to that address. He sent me a letter back thanking me for thanking him. And uh, well, it's kind of a chapter in my life that was important dealing with other people. Right, and it means a lot. Yes. When you benefit from yeah. it. That's really nice. Uh, the other case happened to be my major professor, <laughs> uh, Dan Wiersma in which he uh, was frugal, but he had university salary. His wife was a teacher. He had a couple of sons. Uh, but anyways, uh, we were so borderline survival mode as a grad student. My wife was in accounting, but she had made an error in the checkbook and missed an entry. We thought we had more money than was actually in the account. So we went over to J.C. Penney's and bought the two boys a new pair of shoes each. Well, it came home because there was no money in the account. And she said, we don't have any money left. There's no bread or milk in the house. I went to Dr. Wiersman and said, Dan, I need some help. I said, we don't have any bread or milk. He says, I just got back from a research trip or something. And he pulled out a $10 traveler's check and handed it to me. And I thanked him greatly and always remembered that. And I was able to pay him back in a couple of days, but sure. that day I needed money for bread and milk. Right. And so he was that kind of an individual, kind of under the skin, but nevertheless uh, he realized very friendly he, and right. was able to help. And I appreciated that greatly. Nicely said. I was never a best student in the world. And I sloughed some classes. And ordered to some classes, which would have been better had I understood what was going on. But uh, I was eventually able to attain the goal of teaching students, right. and since I didn't really care for the high school uh, level of students, or grade school, uh, I really enjoyed working with the collegiate age peoples. And for the most part, they were interested in learning. Occasionally you had one who didn't want to, but that's the way life goes. So. In my tr when I retired, uh, I got out my old uh, grade books, and we never had large classes. Typically, 25 to 50 was our max class sizes in the rooms. And the laboratories were always in addition to that, and the way our system worked, the lab grade transferred over about a quarter of the entire class grade. So I have no idea how many students I had in the lab, but there were the 25 years, but I had a pretty close record of the uh, lecture grades I had issued. And with the smaller classes, I had issued approximately 4,000 letter grades during that time frame. So that worked out well. Okay. Uh, at Cal Poly, they had a, a, early in the fall quarter, they'd have a thing called the WOW, Week of Welcome. And the students, incoming students would come. So my wife and I always hosted that younger group of people. And one of the very common questions, do you give a lot of A's? My response is, I don't give anything. You earn every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at today. Yeah. I enjoyed the time frame. I I'm, would not be a good professor anymore. And oh, I'm sure too, I'm too set in my ways. And I, I you, bring, you bring what you've learned and you pass it on. I've forgotten half of what I new in the past. <laughs> I've never used it very much after retiring. So, <laughs> Dr. Lambert, I want to thank you very much. This has been very, very nice. And my